Hello. I'm Frederick Mugiru. I'm Professor Papa Professor. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Michael Hansmeyer for the International Lecture Service this night. Uh, it's part of a specific program we try to develop, surely partly uh, around the MR, so that first opened uh, largely as a, for the International Lecture Service for the schools. And uh, the work uh, of Michael Hansmeyer is very important for me because it came from uh, a background I know. Uh, if I remember well, he was a student at the Columbia. Yes, uh, university working through uh, processes uh, and software like algorithmic that uh, working mainly on geometrical shape at the beginning, trying to uh, introduce some uh, variation. I kind remember of well with uh, L shapes, L shapes, L shapes, yes. And uh, what, what is very interesting to me is the process. After that, he, he developed the work around uh, solid uh, preconditioned solid. Yes. And I'm trying to penetrate the geometry of objects from the inside. Uh, and uh, through a process of division, it, it changed completely the rule of the geometry. And the third step was surely the integration of the serial automaton in the process and increasing the division. And at the end, at the infinite, creating incredible objects. And what is very interesting in the work is two things. First, it could be the decorative aspect of the last work, and to be fascinating, and no work which are worldly interesting. The columns, you will see, because uh, it's introduced into a very famous thematic of the history of, of architecture, is the, the thematic of the ornament. Uh, and of course, it could be a crime, the ornament could be a crime in the history of architecture. That this ornament is not purely uh, a decor, it's a, a completely a mathematical uh, order organized and completely rational. There is no opposition between rationalist uh, vision of the geometry and the ornament. It's a complex uh, a fusion of both. And the other aspect is a new idea of materiality, uh, which is for me uh, absolutely fundamental, is the possibility to uh, simulate uh, natural processes or to produce through generative process uh, a new, an over nature, an over uh, materiality. Uh, this work is absolutely for me contemporary to other works, and Michael is part of the new generation of really creative architects, and uh, I hope he will be part of a little exhibition at the Computer Center in Spain. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Frederick, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the lecture is called Undrawable. Um, it's going to consist of three projects that are, are not drawable in the um, conventional sense, um, and that are perhaps even inconceivable using traditional means. Um, either there are too many variants or permutations that are produced, or the forms that I'm going to show are going to entail a, a complexity in their attributes, whether it's the number of faces or angles, or even the relationship between components, um, that they can't be created using a, a traditional CAD program like AutoCAD, or, and, and can't be created using this um, pencil above. The, the projects have, have one thing in common. In, in each case, I try to um, start with as very little as possible geometry at the outset, and add the information um, through the, the processes, more or less. I'm going to just jump back one bit. And um, I was speaking at Elisa's class today. So for those of you that are in this class, please bear with me. Um, and I am going to tell you, I'll, I'll dim the screen one second. How lucky all of you are um, to be here at, at this time today, if you are interested in, in computation, if you're interested in, in any way in, in or incorporating algorithms in your work, if you're interested in, in, exploring, in exploring processes, because, um, because the, the tools that have been developed in the last five years, the software that's been developed in the last five years, it's, it's, it's something that, that I think previous generations of architects only, only dreamt of. Um, and I, I realize this makes me sound um, unnecessarily old, but... Um, I, when I was at Columbia, I started, um, 
I started, well, I have a background, I have to say, in, in finance and a background in, um, in consulting. So I started making the architecture using um, Excel. Um, it, was, it was the only thing I knew, and it was the only um, scripting language I knew. Processing hadn't, hadn't been invented. Um, the, the, the scripting languages such as RhinoScript and um, Mel were, were just being introduced. And, um, and the only way I knew how to, how to create forms on a, on a procedural level was by having endless and endless amounts of, of numbers and, and links between these numbers. Um, and then in the end, using Excel actually to draw, to draw these numbers somehow. There's, um, I've mentioned it earlier, there's 65,000 rows that are possible in Excel and 256 columns. So, so quite a number of linkages you can, you can make. And um, the initial output was, was quite disappointing. It looked like this. These are, actual, these are just the numbers which are drawn um, using, using Excel. Um, I started by making a, a mapping. This was for a class. And um, the, um, these were numbers that came out of a GIS system anyway. So the idea was, why should we map this um, manually? Why can't we keep it in the computer if it's in an Excel format anyway? Um, and these were the first quite abstract um, maps of, I believe, Long Island City, which are supposed to show, I don't know, a socioeconomic distribution or something like this. Um, and, and encouraged by this, I, I went on to um, three-dimensional processes. I tried to, I tried to create three-dimensional figures using Excel, which was very difficult. This was one of the first, um, first output things. The, the, the perspective flew all over the place. Um, and, and, and most of the time, one, one, just, got, um, one just got images such, such as this. This is the direct Excel output in the spreadsheet. Um, the Excel drew incredibly slowly, so you would have to wait 30 minutes before you could actually see, um, see any output. Um, so, so there wasn't much room for trial and error, which is also the reason why all these perspectives are completely skewed and, um, and, and crooked. Here's another one. And here I'm beginning to, beginning to get it a little bit more right. Um, the, the initial shape that, that you're going to see is actually, is actually something that is as simple as this, um, if, if created in Maya. But in Excel, it looks like this. Um, Excel wasn't able to hide lines in the background, so, so all the lines were in a way at a forefront, one, forefront one that um, involuntarily worked with transparencies. These, these were, however, um, the, one thing that I found interesting about this was that they were, however, parametric already. You, the, the parameters were all there as numbers, as relationships, and by, by pressing the touch of a button, the, the um, the visualization changed completely, not only in terms of its rotation, but also how, in terms of the colors, how edges um, intersected, in terms of how um, the, the angles, whether they were curvature or spiky angles, and so on. So one side view uh, in three different configurations by just changing a, a um, parameter. And here, the, the hope of getting it 3D, of course, it's hardly readable, the form, because you are unable to hide, or I was unable to hide um, the edges. And, and another version of this, um, in, in a detail of one of the facades, same here, same here, same here. And then came Maya. And, and suddenly, with Maya, it was, on, on the one hand, it was a fantastic relief, um, because I could, I could instantly export these geometries and, and import them into, into Mel. Um, on the other hand, these very same geometries ended up looking surprisingly a lot like, like everybody else's stuff. Um, and, and this was really interesting to me because it, it, um, it asked the question, or it posed the question, how, um, how the software we use really affects, affects the output. And in, in this sense, the geometry was the same. Um, and it was purely the visualization that changed how, how something looked. These are the same points as previously, but we are we are just visualizing it in a different way. It's the identical geometry. Um, I think on a more fundamental level, I think the software actually that we use, whether it's Rhino right now or so, changes um, also how we think about the, the forms we produce. And, and, and that's something that I'm going to be um, addressing a little bit later on. So once again, something that was, this is the, the same image that you see uh, generated as, um, as Maya and um, in Maya. And, and it, looks, it looks completely like something that you would um, have seen 10 years ago at, at any architecture school. Um, with that, I'll jump back. 
But right now you have, and I am, I'm not, not a salesman um, for, for processing. Right now you have languages such as processing which, which enable you to, which have zero barriers to entry in a way, which is very exciting. So you can, they're, they're addressed at, um, at architects, at visual designers, and so on. Um, and, and they enable you with, within one day to, to create pretty amazing output. Um, all of the processes and all of the programs and all the output that I will show in this lecture has been generated in, in processing. It's, it's, it's a free language, has a huge forum, it's, you, can, you can download it, um, you can exchange code, and so on. Um, I'll, I'll just also quickly go back and, and say for one second only what, what my interest is, is not about. Um, and my interest is not about what, what or I'm, I'm less interested in, and, and probably most of you are, are very familiar with this distinction, but I'd, I'll, I'll nonetheless bring it up. I'm less interested in generating these, these, these sorts of um, parametric facades, even though this is one that I was involved with and where I, 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 wrote, I wrote the um, pro program to, to generate it. With these, these parametric facades, they have a geometry that's there from the beginning. In this case, this is by Herzog and Demeron. It's the Elbphilharmonie, uh, quite, quite a spectacular concert hall that they're building in Hamburg. And the, the image on the right shows, um, shows a, a printing process on two sides. The dots are, are printed, um, and the diameter of these dots, the, all these dots are basically there in the beginning, and the diameter of these dots depends on how much view one wants to have from the, from the particular room that is behind it, or how much um, protection from the sun you need, or how much um, noise insulation one needs. In this case, not noise insulation, and so on. But what one basically has is a, a geometry that is there from the beginning, and one, through this parametrization, one is, one is changing attributes of this, this geometry. It's, um, so we're changing the, the, the diameter, basically, of the dots. Um, and this is a, a sim similar project in a way that I was um, involved in with a firm OOS Architects. It's a computer center for Novartis. Um, it com it's, the idea was that one had these um, initially initially computers had these kind of cards that you inserted into them, and um, they were they were actually paper cards that were read. And this is this is an idea that they had for this facade. Um, the facade changes depending upon whether there is um, the, the function of the rooms that are behind it. But, but once again, the, the pattern of the, the dots was there, of the, of the apertures, and, and one is using a process only to, to modify these. The, it's, it's stamped out of aluminum, essentially. I'll skip over this. Um, and, and they, they're, they're interesting in the sense that there, there, is there is zero repetition in this pattern. So one, one does achieve something that is, that is, that is um, in a way, unique. That they're, they're, they are an example of mass fabrication, um, mass customization, excuse me, where it's suddenly it's, it's not more expensive to produce variety than, than to produce um, the same shape over and over and over and over again, like we had in 50 years of modernism. Um, but they are, um, but I think in, in each case, the, the, the geom yeah, the, the, it's what I've said, the geometry is there from the outset. This is a proposed proposal by Kengo Kuma where the, um, the window size changes and then it's mapped, so to say, onto one of these free forms and, and one by Zahra Hadid, a courthouse where the aperture of the um, grid is, is variable and changes. And in, in a language like processing, you, you, can, you can generate this geometry, you can write this program, and you can generate this geometry in, 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 a, very, in a very short time. I'll, let's see, it should play again. No? Hmm. How do I play this? Is it, oh, it's playing there. Okay, it's not playing here. Um, what you, what you have on the, on the right is simply a, a, a map that would represent, for instance, the, how much you can, the visibility or how much you want to look out. And on, on the left, a, a predetermined geometry um, whose attributes change depending upon the corresponding value on, on the right side. Um, and and that, is, 
that is how these things are. So this map on the right side could represent, for instance, the view, or could represent the, the shading that is necessary. Um, and that's, that's all there is um, to it. Which, which not, not, not to say that that couldn't be interesting, but I'm, I'm more interested in, in going from, from using parameters to control um, geometries of existing objects to, to using parameters to control processes that generate new, um, to using parameters to control processes to generate new geometries. Um, the, the first project I'll show is, um, is, called, um, is based on voxel geometries. For those of you that don't know voxels, they are simply, um, they're like a three-dimensional pixel. Um, and it, it's these, these um, projects are supposed to show how a simple process, when it's repeated over and over again, can lead to um, forms that have very elaborate um, features. There's, there's two parts to it. One is called the game of life, and the second is based on a process called reaction diffusion. Um, this here is um, an example of a voxel space. And, and why, why are voxels interesting to me? Because on the one hand, they're, they're, they can be treated like a granular substance. If you have, have enough of them, you can basically produce almost any kind of shape if, if the resolution is, is right. Um, in the simplest state, they're either on or off. So, and that's, that's what you're seeing right here. They're, they're either white or they're, they're non-existent. But they could also contain um, many, different types of, many different types of information. In a way, getting back to this granular substance, it's like, it's like, a, 3D, like a 3D printer, um, which just puts on point over point over point over point. I guess a 3D printer does it in a line, but, it, but it's, the same, um, it's a similar process. And, and they're neutral in their form. So it's not like we're starting out with some elaborate geometry um, that's going to define how, how the output looks. But why else voxels? I mean, a voxel space is, in a way, it's a calculation network. So each, each voxel is, can be aware of what its neighbors are. Are these neighbors on? Are they off? What, what kind of values do they have stored in them? And, and not only can it, so not only through this awareness can it store information, but it can also propagate it. Um, it can exchange information based on, on conditional rules or on, on differential equations. Um, the, the perhaps simplest form of this um, not voxel space, jumping back to the cell, a pixel, um, is an example popularized by Stephen Wolfram in, in a new kind of science. And um, it's, it's called a cellular automata rule 30, what you're seeing here. It starts with a pixel that is all the way on on the top. And this one is in the middle, this one is black, and it, it looks at each pixel below it, looks at the three pixels above it. And depending upon whether these are white or black, um, they, this, this pixel changes to white or to black. And, and through this very simple system, you can get, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's gained attention, I think, in, in across the field of physics, math, computer science, even theoretical biology because um, it can start to produce shapes that are seen as complex, and people start to um, talk about uh, something called emergence. Um, that, that's what you're seeing here. This is one pattern that is, that is produced here. The people speak of a second order emergence where yeah, simple rules and interactions lead to complex output. Um, to, to go one step further, there is the game of life by, by Conway. And in, in this case, the, it's, it's very similar. The, um, the, the cells that you see here are aware of their neighbors, and, and they turn themselves on and off according to the states of their neighbors. And um, though the, the simulations are deterministic, they are, uh, they're not predictable. They are, you can see, and you can interpret into them. You can see stuff such as, for instance, a glider, as people say, or um, what else do we have, puffers and so on. And um, so you, you're starting to see behaviors that are based on very simple rules. But what, um, what I was interested in is how can we bring this to a 3D, um, to three dimensions? What kind of formations or structures are conceivable in 3D? And, and one way to answer this question is through a simply exhaustive um, simulation of the rules. Just like Stephen Wolfram went through 255 rules, one can do the same in the 3D voxel um, space. One, the initial configuration in these experiments that I'll show is always a single cell that is on in the center, and then you see 
Subsequently, what evolves in multiple iterations? It starts with iteration eight on the top and ends with 20 or so at the bottom. Um, what, what evolves? And so, so this one cell at the beginning, the, the whole idea is to take as minimal as possible as a, as a starting geometry and to um, add information through the process. And this is basically, it's just a, a timeline of how, how these shapes evolved. It's always from two different angles that you're looking at it. So if you're looking at it once head on and once at, a, I don't know, from, from at the corner of the space. The rules are at the bottom. Um, and, and the images look a bit, bit rounder than, than voxels because they're, they're polygonized. They're turned into, into surfaces. Um, and one can, one can um, specify different, different initial configurations, what, what is called a seed, or one can um, change the size of the room. But, but the question comes up, and, and this is something that I, I found quite frustrating, is where, where is the agency in, of the architect in this? I mean, one is basically, uh, how, what are the possibilities of intervention? I mean, th there are some limited means one can specify the initial configuration, the initial seed, or add, add information along the way. Or one can use different sets of rules at different iterations of the process or at a different parts in space, or even freeze part of the of the voxel space, but how can one really sculpt the output while, while intervening on a procedural level and not getting into actually changing the, the voxels or the pixels? Um, and and I, I, I will show a bunch of examples of, of screens that are produced, and um, though they do exhibit some variety amongst them, they, they also have quite a bit of, of similarity um, one to another. So one sees, for instance, um, usually either um, 90 degree angles or 45 degree angles. Um, one see, they, they tend to be at one, one scale and, and, and not, let's say, fractal in nature. There's no parts that are more differentiated really than, than other parts. Um, there, there's additional possibilities of control by, by um, splitting voxels into higher resolution, by um, displaying multiple iterations of the process or changing the polygonization parameters. And, and then you get shapes such as this. This has a higher, higher resolution. But um, in, in the end, um, in, in the end I, I wish I could say that there was any intentionality behind these forms. Um, they're, they're, they're more or less created using trial and error. And, um, they are, there is a tweaking of the parameters, but, these, but there's not really a relationship from one form to another. So if I tweak one parameter, I get a completely different form. So I can't develop a form into something. I can't, I can't say, I, I like this attribute of the form. I'd like to keep this and, 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 and start to develop it over into something else. I can't take forms and, and merge their attributes. That, these, these things are impossible. There's, uh, ultimately, I felt that there, for, for an architect, there wasn't enough um, agency in, 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 generating, in generating shapes. Certainly there was in creating the process, but not in creating the, the forms. Um, from the second part of the voxel experiments is, is called reaction diffusion. And these are um, patterns that you see, for instance, in, it's, it's, it's a chemical process, and they're patterns that you can see, for instance, in, in sand dunes. Um, that's what you're seeing, seeing at the bottom. Um, in zebras and, and so on, they're associated with, with a bunch of different natural phenomena. Um, they, they can also be modeled using a voxel space. Instead of having voxels being on and off, um, voxels can have um, discrete values. So there can be not just 0 or 1, but 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and, and so on. Um, and in, in, in two dimensions, one starting with a few cubes, you get patterns that, that develop like this one. Um, and, and by changing the starting configurations and changing how these, these voxels, or pixels in this case, interact, um, one, one would arrive at something, could arrive at something similar to a zebra pattern or a, a, a sand dune um, pattern. Um, what happens in three dimensions? Um, in, in three dimensions, you, you, you get definitely more interesting formations, I think. And, and unlike the, the, the binary voxels that we saw before, 
one gets um, one gets different types of curvatures. One gets there, there, there's, there's different scales. Um, you, one gets more of an outside and inside. Uh, ma many attributes one one can can read into it. The the possibilities of intervention. What an architect can do once a simulation has started is is surprisingly similar. One one can control the initial seating. Um, one can control instead of the rules, one can control the the um, formulas that that calculate how these chemical these chemicals, as I say, these are the values that are supposed to be in the voxels, interact. Um, and um, in, in a way, I, I always saw this as, as having a, a, a little dish of chemicals in front of me, and I could add either is one, one chemical or in, in the form of um, a value to some of these seeds, and in the best case, some, some, sort, of, some sort of form would grow. Which, um, which, is a, which is an attractive proposition in a way, grow, growing your own building, but um, which was nonetheless um, difficult. One could, one, could even, one could even see if one has a test tube, one could even see the computer as a test tube and using the motion sensors shake the computer and with that um, the, 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 the forms that are produced change similar to a mixing that would take place in a test tube. Um, but there are, though there are multiple scales and more, more complex curvatures, um, different sized intervals, um, and the possibilities of creating permutations, um, and by permutations I mean forms that are somehow related to each other, at the same time one always waited very, very long for something to be produced. Um, often it, it, it took, once again, half an hour or something for something to come out, and this limited your possibility to go back and, and, and influence something. And, and very often, it, um, if you change some sort of parameter, it would take another 10 minutes for this information to propagate through the system and for you to be able to see what you actually change. So, so after a while, you, 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 I, you almost begin to lose patience. Um, this is a, so by, per, by, by, by permutations, I'll jump back to that word. Um, this is, by permutations, I mean the moment we're designing, um, not an object, but the moment we're designing a, a process that generates objects. We have the possibility of running this process over and over again to produce variants of a form. Um, and that's, that's, what's going on, that's what's going on here. This is a, a first variant, um, a similar variant using the same thing. The, the zone in the middle is simply blocked out so that this chemical concentration can't move there. Another variant. And another one showing um, actually two sequences. So the black sequence was a first step, and then the, the green one is a, is a later, a later iteration. Um, and um, one, as an interesting side note, these these processes basically produce um, a continuous three-dimensional space. So you see on on this one, you can see that the left side is very similar to the right side. If you don't see it instantly, um, this is the um, the vision line. And they're, they're basically three-dimensional tiles that you can endlessly stack, stack on, on top of each other. Um, there are an advantage of this using this kind of geometry is that it's, um, it's incredibly easy to produce and easy to print because the surfaces are continuous, they're non-intersecting, and, and you can press a button and the 3D printer will, 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 will give you a form very humble in its dimensions like this one. Or like this one. Um, moving, moving on. This, this was. These were the first part was experiments with um, based on voxels. The second, um, the second um, project or the second main theme is, is similar to the first one in that in that it's also interested in exploring a process that doesn't start, doesn't begin with very much input that reduces the input to something as minimal as possible and tries to add the information um, through, through the process. Um, this, the second process works not with volumes, such as the voxels, but with, um, but with planes, with surfaces. Um, and it is based on subdivision processes. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a bit of a background. What, what is subdivision? Um, it is, and I'm missing a slide here. Oh no! Um, it is. I will. Let's see. I'll try to find that slide. One second, please. Okay. 
It is, um, it's something that came out of character animation. It's something that was, these, these subdivision processes were first formulated in 1978 by um, Mr. Catmull and a Mr. Clark, and later by, in a different scheme, Dew and Sabin. And Mr. Catmull went on to, um, to um, found Pixar Studios and to produce some of the very first animation movies using, using this kind of an algorithm. It's, um, what, what you basically have is you have a, a coarse mesh, a coarse mesh of polygons that is supposed to be smoothened or refined. And, and that's what you're seeing here on the left side. You have this, this I guess, Gary, the grandpa, um, he, he is, a, uh, is a mesh with control points that can be refined. If you, um, what, what's going on? In, in, in two dimensions, you have a, an initial form on the left, and you, you just, in each case, add, um, split it. You, you subdivide it. You can, this is a simplest scheme, you can subdivide it down the middle um, and you get more and more and more and more faces, four times more faces every time. Um, and let's see, is it showing this? Yeah. And after 10 steps you have, you have something like a million, a million faces. If you, if you change the, the rules though, if you say, I don't want to produce a, a, a smooth shape, but I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to change how the points are placed at each point, then you get, you get entirely different forms. And that's what you're, you're looking at here. Just by changing the midpoint, the positioning of the midpoint, you get, this is in two dimensions, of course, you get um, a different shape after a few iterations. And after eight iterations, the, the effect, or after six, it looks like this. So the same scheme is just um, applied several times. Um, and I'll jump back. In the, the same, the process works the same way in three dimensions, and that's what what you saw with with the, the Gary's game. Um, you can a, a a cube. The faces of a cube are uh, are divided into into more faces. And, and what you're beginning to see is that the position of the, the cube's vertices of its points depend not only on, on the individual face, but also on those faces around it. So once again, you have this, this idea, similar to the, the voxels, of um, a, a network of, of faces that, that know something or that are somehow connected to, to their neighbors and can somehow propagate information. Um, I won't show you too many of these formulas. Um, but if you, if you change these weights, these weights that you can, you can and by weight I simply mean a, um, a, a way of determining where a point is placed in relationship to the old points, by changing simply this after a few iterations you, you get a form that, that looks like this one. This is, I think, in its eighth iteration. Um, so the original six faces of the cube are divided into 24 faces, into 96 and then you get um, 400,000 faces. And just to, to give you the idea of the, the cube, you're actually, if this is a, the cube right here, you're actually looking at it from, from here, from this diagonal view. Um, you can, by changing the values of the weights, the same cube produces, for instance, this shape or, or, or this shape. And, and note that the, the weights, how the points are specified, can, can vary at each iteration. But in each case, the, the um, topology of this, this remains the same. It's, it's a, like a sphere or, or a cube. It's just articulated somewhat differently. Um, and I'm, I'm showing the example of a cube because it's arguably the, the simplest three-dimensional form. Maybe, maybe the pyramid is as simple. It's one of the, the platonic solids um, so suggested by Plato to, to represent the, the elements um, on Earth. Um, and, and thus the cube itself doesn't have much information. The, 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 the formations that you saw, they, they come through how the process, this very simple process of just the splitting of the faces, how we apply it, the parameters we use to apply it. Um, and the, the an interesting thing to me about these subdivision processes is that they work at different levels. So they, in, in the first iteration, they help to define what the overall form looks like. Um, the second iteration, still, still on the level of the overall form. And the, the further you go, the more it, it, it describes the form stays the same, and it describes the surface development um, at iteration five and six, until we get to a point where we're really 
And it's hard to see on this. No, you can see it quite well. You're, you're, really, um, you're really talking about more of a texture or a microsurface that's, that's developing on top of it. So it's the same process. Um, and it's, it's, it's the same processes that is creating these different, working at multiple scales. Um, and it's, they, I mean, the, the question is, do, do these processes allow, if, if, if one would see this as an ornament, do they allow um, an ornament to grow on top of an existing form, or, or are, they, are they more involved in what, what the shape of an ornament is, is, is from the start? Um, there's a, and what I'm showing here is, you can see on the, the, the left side are just some of these weights that I'm changing. And on the right, you can see how the cube develops as one changes the, the weights. I've added this rotation just so that you can see it from more, from more than one side. And, and it's, it's a linear process. So a small tweak to the weights, as you can see, and this, that's represented by the, the um, green dots on the left, leads to a, a tweak, a small change in the, in the form on the right. So, so the process is linear, and that's, that, that's very different than some of the other um, voxel geometries. Um, the, it's, it's deterministic, but because there are so many different weights, it's not entirely predictable. Um, and sometimes the most interesting phenomena occur um, are, are the, ones that you, that the ones that you don't anticipate, and that's what, what I found by, by accident is Sometimes, by, by changing a weight, you have a weight, let's say, of 2.9 on the left side and 3.01 on the right. At three, but a totally different shape um, occurs or emerges. And, and, and in this case, the reason it is so is because two points are being created on top of each other, and the computer thinks it's one point, and suddenly the, the topology of the shape changes. Um, and this, this same effect can, will lead to, um, yeah, there you you can see an example of it. The same effect leads to um, a, a several new attributes in the shape, such as this, this porosity. Um, the, and these are also all based on, on a cube. There were biologists who, who thought that they resemble underwater plants and invited me to a, a lecture in Venice. Um, and, and because they thought maybe the, the, the cell division mechanism is similar to what is happening in these underwater plants, it turns out there's, there's absolutely no similarity at all in the generative processes. Um, but it brings up the question, are these forms, um, or, or as ornament, is it, is it figurative? Um, it's, is it intentionally figurative? Am I, am I, and, and what, what is my intention? When do I, when do, or when does the architect, on a more general level, stop this process and say, Okay, this is this this is completed. Um, is is it when we encounter things we know, things we don't know, things we we find um, beautiful, interesting, and, and so on? Um, I in, in the beginning I always wished that the computer would also evaluate the forms, and then I could I could just sit back and it would produce these these shapes overnight, and then the, the next morning I would have have um, very many new things to look at. Um, I, I guess in a way that would get boring after a while. Um, but there is not, I, or at least I wasn't able to, to find a way of, of evaluating, is this form interesting? I wasn't even sure what to evaluate, what to evaluate the forms for. Um, one, can, one can easily evaluate, are these forms not pleasing? So there's some geometries that are just so convoluted, where there's so many intersections that, that one finds them not interesting. Um, but it's difficult to define what, what one likes. Um, by, by adding additional rules, you, you, can, you can generate even more um, possible geometries using this, this very simple process. Um, the, the, the question came up, how, so, so one is able to produce th these shapes, how can one, and one can, one can begin to control them by tweaking them, by going back and forth, as you saw, with this turning circle, um, there, there's, there's a way that one can get a certain control over the forms. But how can one apply them more specifically? Um, and, and, and there's two, two techniques I looked at. Um, they both involve um, non-uniform non weights, which just means that the weights that are used, the parameters that are used, are not the same at 
at, at different parts of the mesh. And, and I tried linking um, the weights to um, attributes of the mesh, of, of the form that is produced in the intermediary steps. That's an intrinsic specification. And I also tried to use simply what, what can be seen as environmental factors, so placing different parameters in the environment. Here's, here's perhaps the easiest example of placing different parameters in the environment. Um, one has an initial form, which is an elongated cube, which you see on the left. And um, there are three sets of weights, which is, you can see, position of the weights. And um, the, the, which weight is used, which values are used, just, they, they just blend over into each other along, along the y-axis. And the forms that you see are differentiated on, on the y-axis. So the, the form on the right looks somewhat similar on the bottom and on the top, but, but is different in the middle. And the, the variant A is the same in a way, except that on, in, on the bottom it blends over into the, the bottom surface. Um, that, that's an extrinsic specification. And the interesting thing about this extrinsic specification is that if you move, if you, once you've set up the environment, if you move the form through the environment, it, it changes because suddenly it's closer to certain weights than to other ones. If you start to turn the form or scale it, 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 it changes. Um, so, so you're setting up almost like your own little, oh, that was a bit fast, oh, okay, world. And there's quite, there's quite a bit of detail um, in these. What, what you're already seeing is that these geometries are, unlike the, the, the voxels, are going to be very difficult to generate, bring out of the computer. And that, that's, a, that's a challenge. I'm jumping a bit ahead of myself. Um, and another form um, that has been differentiated along the y-axis. Another one that I showed earlier, and, and one more. And um, the, the, the evolution of these shapes is, or how, how one goes from one to another is, um, is something that I'll, I will show more on a later example. The, so what, you, what I showed right now is how one placed weights in the environment. The second, second thing you can do to differentiate the forms more is to use attributes that are part of the mesh topology, such as the, by, by topology I just mean the, the graph of the mesh, meaning um, the number of edges per vertex, the number of faces per vertex, um, is the edge, is the vertex located on the border, on the outside, and so on. Um, and by, by, by doing so, one can, also, one can also begin to differentiate the form very much at different locations because your, your mesh, unless it's very uniform, your input mesh, the input form um, may, may already contain certain bits of information. Um, one can also use the mesh topographical attributes. And by, by topography, I mean um, s stuff such as its curvature, um, planarity of the faces, how big the faces are, how big the circumference is. Um, is a face jagged? Is it, and by, by face, I just mean the, the many different surfaces that, that are part of the mesh. You can kind of see them on the left side. Um, uh, what you see here are, for instance, the, what, what looks round if you magnify it up a lot, isn't really round using these processes. These are curvature plots um, that, that show the, the differentiation of surface curvatures that occur using these three platonic solids if one uses the default values. Um, and, and then using this kind of differentiation, one arrives at forms such as this one or this one or this one. Or this one, and and um, it's one one difficulty I always had was um, describing describing what kind of what I'm actually seeing, what I'm actually looking at. I, I had a very hard time describing. Okay, one could say these are little I don't know balls on top of the surface, or these are checkers, or so on. But but what I was um, what I found I was missing, at least, was, was an adequate vocabulary to describe um, the, the attributes that, that, that I'm seeing. Um, and, and I would have been interested, or I was interested, in starting to classify some of these attributes um, to create a sort of an index that I could reference and go back to. Um, but but there, this, this, this is something that um, was, wasn't possible, um, to me at least but which became a bit more accessible when one began to graph, basically, 
how one is combining the attributes we just um, that I just showed um, with um, how how one is combining them um, and and using them to inf influence a weight, and then one could say, okay, this these operators together they produce this kind of curvature, or these operators up here they produce this kind of effect. So one, one isn't describing, um, one is basically describing a, a series of steps uh, of processes that are involved and how a series of relations, which is the lines that you're seeing between certain attributes, that, that create an effect. Um, finally, I'd like to show um, these processes um, applied to the design and fabrication of, of ornamented um, columns. Why, why a column? And this is the, the first time that um, I, I eventually um, try to get the, the, these forms out of the computer. Um, but but one, one step before that, why the design of the column? It, it has a, a wealth of historical references. Um, it is when, when one speaks, even the name column order um, resonated in a way because um, that the, the speaks of, of a type of system, of a type of, of sets of rules. Um, the, and, but, but most of all, it's, it's a very much a continuation of using these platonic solids, which are very simple forms. One can use, for instance, the, a cylinder, a very simple cylinder, as an input form to, to these processes. I um, designed a, a series of prototypes, and the... the um, one of the key questions was, how much information do you put into the process? Do you, do you give it just a simple cylinder, or do you articulate the cylinder? Um, because, because I had some sort of shape in mind, um, I gave it a more articulated input mesh, one that had, um, well, first of all, proportions. It had a base. It had a, a type of fluting, um, a capital, and so on. So instead of just six faces of a cube, there's actually seven 72 faces going in here. And is it the, these columns, they have a, a fractal nature. You can zoom in, and you can basically zo zoom in more. And one could, one could continue this process um, almost infinitely, um, based, limited on the, 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 the memory you have available. Um, and they, the, you, using this, this process, I gener generated um, Hundreds of permutations. There, they each one has much in common with the one before it. The the, the process is, is linear, and it, it's easy to it's easy in a way to tweak. Here you can see the the processing program that um, that is used as a screenshot of the program that is used to, to generate it. And there's the, the once again going back to the role of the architect. There's really two steps of agency. The, the first one is is to design or to formulate the process that one uses to to create something. And the, the second step is then to use the process um, iteratively to produce, the, um, to, to produce the, the, the shape or one of the shapes that one wants to produce. Um, the, I think the, each, each one requires quite, uh, as much input as, as the other. Um, and, and that begs, but, but they are separate in a way. And, and can, can these two things be done by two people? Um, yes, definitely. Because an interesting thing is if you have somebody else using a process which one person designed, he, he or she might use it in a completely different way than, than one, one intended, and, and often one is surprised what people come up with. Um, at the same time, I would argue that some of the more interesting steps are, are achieved if, um, if these, two, these two steps can inform each other. In other words, if you can if you can not just use a process to design multiple variants, but if you can actually say, OK, I'm able to produce these variants now. I'm going to go back, change the process a little bit to produce something else. And that, that's difficult if it's two, two people. Um, how, how, does one, how does one choose what one uses? What you're looking at right now, by the way, is, is the midsection of, of one of the columns. And there are what, uh, what the, the, way to, the way that I went about developing these shapes is to, among other things, use, use a permutation browser, so to say. So I, um, I let a process run, and then I gave the computer a certain degree of freedom, a certain span within which to change weights. And, and then the computer would produce, this algorithm would produce different permutations of a form. 
one could choose one, per, one of these permutations and then use it as an input for, for successive calculations. Or one could intervene and manually tweak a weight. Um, one has, the moment you have these permutations, which you're looking at on, on right over here of a, of a simpler form, one can combine certain sh shapes, move, move them together into one. I can take the, the, the basic form from one and combine it with the um, micro texture of another, and, and so on. Because there are, there are just too many dimensions that you could graph them linearly or graph them uh, um, sequentially, like in the um, Wolfram rules or the voxel rules. Um, the, the, the weights aren't homogeneously applied which is, which is um, which you can see here, there's some, some surfaces which are very smooth and unarticulated and other ones which have, which have, um, which have more detail. Once again, the mid, mid section of a column which is, which is developed by, by combining um, certain permutations and fusing them. Um, how, how, to fabricate, how to fabricate this? I, I hesitated for a long time and the reason I hesitated for a long time was that um, well, for one thing, I didn't want to get my hands dirty. I, I, I liked the way the shapes were in, in the computer um, with uh, their perfection in the sense that there, there, were, there were no physical attributes to take into account. But, but another thing is I, I didn't know how to, how to get the geometries out of the computer. Um, we, we considered a bunch of techniques. We considered um, 3D printers, but with 3D printers, you have there's a trade-off in resolution and size, so you have some some um, 3D printers, one that Jose and Alyssa, I think, were looking at in Italy, which is able to produce gigantic, um, gigantic structures, but at a resolution of five centimeters or so. There's um, other ones are, are super fine, but they can produce something that's maximum 60 centimeters tall or, or so. Um, I, I think in three or five or 10 years down, down the line, I don't know how many, it will definitely be possible to just press print on the computer and it, it'll come out naturally in, in whatever size one would like. But at, at this point, 3D printers weren't an option. Um, we looked at, at, at ETH, where I teach we have a, a, a robot, a KUKA robot, so we were thinking of just taking a, a gigantic piece of wood and successively drilling it, um, drilling it away. But, but that was difficult too because the head of this robot is so big that it can't get into the, the different um, curvatures and crevices. So um, we ended up with a, a, a layered model, actually. And um, in, in generating these layers, the, the first thing I discovered was um, one, what one has to do is one has to take the geometry and slice it into different planes. And, and in doing so, the first thing I discovered was the, um, the horror of the intersection. So when, on the outside, one always sees these smooth surfaces, or when one assumes that it's one single form and it's nice on the inside. This is an actual section, so there's a lot of stuff um, that, that is going on in there that is, that is invisible to the onlooker on the outside unless you would, would turn it around or invert it and so on. Um, how, so the, 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 the challenge was, and this, this actually took some time, was to, um, to create clean cutting lines for, for the laser cutter or the CNC router. So this, this perhaps this is too technical, but it, it, it involved finding um, intersection of the, the planes um, to create lines, seeing which of these lines are connected and form polygons, emitting inside polygons um, or in filtering out small ones, um, and widening, so to say, peninsulas. By, by, by peninsulas, I mean certain parts that would break off um, depending upon the, the material one uses. So, so cardboard, for instance, is, is quite forgiving. One can go down to two or three millimeters and it's stable. Um, but, but these have to be, one has to send an algorithm over it just to, to make it fit for, for the laser cutter. Um, this was the first layered model we produced. It's, it's just a half of a column. Um, it's 3.5 meters high and it's made out of two millimeter um, cardboard sheet. It's produced by two students, Jan Wasser and Florian Hartmann, um, who also used the software to design it. Um, and this is some of the surface detail that you're looking at here. Here it is laying on my desk. Um, it, let's see, one can, does this play? Yeah. So we we're basically, I'm basically go, moving along it. Um, and here you can, you can clearly see the, the different layers as well as the, the marks 
from the laser cutter, um, the burn marks on, on the outside. Um, I, there, were, there were some key, key learnings from this. For, for one thing, I, I, th I found we needed a higher resolution. Um, some of these, these, what looks as, what is articulated here as triangles were actually cones or spikes, and that's something that, that went lost. Um, second of all, we realized weight was an issue. What I didn't know is that, that cardboard is heavier than wood because of the glue inside it. And um, it was impossible to carry this thing. I think we needed six, six people to bring it up the stairs. Of course, it didn't fit in the elevator. Um, and this, this brought up the, the question of um, assembly, disassembling it. There's a, there's a wooden piece in the back to make sure that, that the individual slices align properly. But um, as, as the slices were somehow glued or even screwed onto this wooden piece, um, it, it precluded any, any, any way of, of transport. Um, we um, produced a second full prototype based, based on um, some of these columns. And what, what I mentioned earlier, with, with different permutations, one has the possibility to, to, to fuse columns, to combine columns. And we thought, if we're going to put all this effort into fabricating it, let's try to make a column that looks different from, from different sides while remaining symmetrical in a way when one looks at it. And that's, that's the column. It's actually one that you see on the the, the two rightmost images, and um, they're the same column, just um, seen in a different, pers just rotated, seen in a different perspective. It's it's actually it's two permutations of a column that that have been between the parameters that were used to generate the shapes. So at, at a certain at a certain point of rotation, the parameters kind of um, in, were interpolated over into each other, but not the the output, not the geometry, um, and this creates a, this this kind of a very smooth. Um, form that you see here, um, and you see that even in the diagonal spaces, when it's slightly off-center, you there, there's there's features that take place that aren't just that that lead to something new as opposed to just being a blend of the two columns. Um, this is the a piece of the column in in section um, uh, on, in the view from above. You can see clearly inside there are at this point metal. Um, sorry, wooden sticks to help align it and to give it structure. We also decided to hollow parts of it out um, to make it a bit lighter. Um, this is made of one millimeter um, cardboard, and um, it, it, which really posed a problem for us. We thought it would, be, it would be very easy, but the one millimeter cardboard was so susceptible to heat that it started to warp. So every time the laser went over a certain part, it it, it got stuck because the cardboard warped. So one had to go back to the cutting curves and tell the laser to cut in a certain order so that it would warp equally and balance, balance itself out. Um, and this is the view from the inside. So we, we got not only the, the positive, we got also the negative space. Um, these are the leftover spaces. Um, you can, you can cl clearly see some errors. There's like a piece that looks, looks broken off, and, and it did break off. Um, we, we decided to, um, and, and there's also inconsistencies in terms of how the geometry was, was, was generated, but we, we decided to leave it the way it was and, and, and to say, okay, this is part of the materialization, um, a very pragmatic approach. Here's another um, view of, of the negative. And here is the um, completed column um, exhibited at, at ETH. And one more view of it right there. You, you can see down here on, on the bottom part that the, the pieces don't align as well as on the top. That's something we found out. And this was, we, had, we made the cutting holes 0 0.5 millimeters too big. We thought this would never be an issue, but, um, but it, it, it actually changed how, the, even, even this changed how, how the form was read. Um, and, and you can see what I, I'm just showing this column, this picture again. And the one on the right is quite similar to, to what we were able to produce. So we got a, a, um, a, a fairly accurate rendition of it in 3D. Um, how long did it take, everybody asks me. Um, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say this. It took, but I'm not embarrassed because it was actually me doing a, a good part of the, the cutting. Um, um, so I don't feel too bad. It took, I think, 125 
hours or maybe even 200 hours of laser time, but we had three and then in the end four lasers working simultaneously. So one is down to something like 40 hours or so on, which is a lot, which is very much. Um, which is, and, but it was at this point the only way that we could think of to get it out of the computer. It's, it's, it, I, I see it not as a, as a way to make a thousand columns, um, but, but, but just more of an experiment in, in seeing what could be a possibility of fabricating something like this. Here is a completed, the detail of the prototype. Um, I was invited to, to participate in the Guangzhou Design Biennale, which just, just closed a few days ago in, in Korea. Um, here is a, a picture from my hotel room. And it's a, a design biennale curated by the Korean architect Song H. Song, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, and a Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. Um, the theme was design is, design is not design, which I think sounds better in Korean than it might in English. Um, it, it, it was a really, it is, despite the title, it was a really, um, to me it was a very interesting show because it, it, it didn't, show a series of objects such as lamps, chairs, or vacuum cleaners, but, but really ask the question of what, um, what is a design process? What cost constitutes a design process? Where, where do we have design which may not even have been intentional, or what, what is classified as design, what is not? Um, I, was, I was invited to um, show the columns, um, to show multiple columns, um, because the, what, what I think interested the, the curators was that one was moving away from designing an object and towards designing a process to, um, to that then designs objects. So, so just this, this, um, this, this means of this level of abstraction between designing the object to, to designing the um, <coughs> process. Um, I, there, the, the concept was to have a room some 40 square meters big in which, in which to place um, uh, it was initially supposed to be a forest of columns. It was then scaled down quite a bit. Um, and then and, and once again, to have multiple permutations of columns. To, to, have not, um, to have not, on the one hand, to show not an object, but, but, but multiple objects, to show that this process is capable, one process is capable of designing multiple things. Um, and on the other hand, to, to move away from having, to seeing the output as, as an object, and to start to have it constitute space. And, and, and this is something that, that I'm, 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 I'm very interested in and very interested in, in terms of what, what the next project will be. I, I would really, I would love to see this work at, I mean, in the beginning one had something this big. Um, I, I, would, I would love to see what, what kind of shapes, what kind of forms, what kind of a feeling can be, can be produced if suddenly something is perhaps above you or on the side of you as opposed to just on, on, on a pedestal before you. So this, this to me was an interesting um, first step. There's a room which you can see on the left, and these are crates with pieces of column inside. Um, I, I went to China, um, where we have a, a, a collaboration with Southeast University, and I, I, I looked for somebody to fabricate the, the columns there, which seemed very appealing to me, because then I would have um, less work. And um, it, um, it, was, it was also interesting because we, we tried, instead of using a laser cutter, we tried using a CNC router. And, and this shop happened to be very good with ABS plastic, um, also in one millimeter, which, um, which to me was an interesting material because it has, of course, completely different surface properties, but it also has a slight translucency. So, so suddenly the, the, you have on, on the edges um, light come through. Um, the, um, this is the room. It, on, on the inside, there are mirrors that are being put in place. And, and here you see the columns just before they're being set up. And everything that could go wrong went wrong um, in this project. First of all, the, I mean, as if by divine intervention, the boat got stuck in a typhoon between, um, between China and Korea. And uh, the, all the pieces arrived one, one week late. But, but it turns out that the um, the, the Chinese company used different sized drills to, to, um, to, to cut out the individual slices. On the outside, this wasn't so much a problem, but on the inside, where the columns have to align one, one piece on another, just having a one or two millimeter deviation 
in, in the beginning, it just, it just looked like they were a bit clumsily aligned. But the moment we got up to two meters, they actually started to sway. And the moment we got up to two meters 50, they were, they were, you, you could hardly hold them up. I, I might add, I, I mentioned the issue of weight. Each column weighs 700 kilo. So they, I mean, they had the potential to be fatal if they, um, if they fell over. Um, what, what you're seeing, but that, that wasn't the only thing that went wrong, actually, now that I'm on this topic. The other thing is they ran the drills much too fast. So the material started to burn because they weren't meeting the deadline. Um, and, and this created um, brown spots, not only brown spots, but it also, um, it, it, um, also caused the ABS to melt in certain places, which completely negated the effect of having this very high resolution, um, of having this very high resolution, um, sort of very, very articulated surface. Um, okay, to make a long story short, they had to, um, they had to introduce well, um, steel beams which were welded to a frame on the ground in the, hope of, um, in the hope of stabilizing them. Um, we built them up, and then we realized the third problem. For two columns, they used one millimeter slices. For two other columns, they used 0 0.9 millimeter slices, <laughs> which <laughs> led to the fact that um, two columns were simply 30 centimeters too short. <laughs> in, in, in the meantime, they have had to redo at least a large part of the columns. But we had to, in the very last minute, lower, lower the ceiling down and then initially take away parts of, <laughs> take away parts of the columns. Um, so in a way, you get, I, I guess there are no shortcuts. Um, it, it, it all looked so good. They had a gigantic um, CNC machine, at almost the size of the stage. So I, I was enthused that they could produce 30 slices at once or something like this. But in, in, in the end effect, I think it, there were either communication difficulties or one simply would have had to be there to, um, to ensure that things were, were working the way one wanted them to work. This is the, the, um, the room when it was done as before some of the, before some of the um, issues were addressed and before new parts arrived. It's, a bit, it's running a bit jaggedy, but it's it's a similar it's it's once again it's it's one millimeter yet yet somehow they they look slightly different it's one process um, and it is um, it is at the same time they the, the reason they they look different in terms of color is is that there was if if one imagines the room on the inside there was more light coming down but also this this blueness is added because there was a mirror on two sides of the room. Um, here is one more image. One more, where you can, you can begin here. The light wasn't quite fixed yet. Um, the idea was to have the light coming in from the, from the center and to have it darker on, on, on the outside. And here you can also see that the, the right column is still missing the top, <laughs> in a way. Um, here, here's a detail. And, um, once, once again, here issues. They, it's not not a perfect not a perfect alignment. Um, so so the moment you go into this 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 fabrication, you 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 come, you you have a a, a whole bunch of new new issues. And, and and in 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 designing in designing these shapes, in a way, the fabrication was an afterthought. Um, it was, which which I think is in retrospect a great limitation. Um, one. I, I mean, the, the, the layering is more or less, as I explained, a default option. But if, if one has this layering, how can one, if one goes forward with something like this, how can one use the layers to, to, to actually bring out um, certain attributes of the layering? How can one, can one have spacers between them so that light goes through? Can one um, have, make the layers, um, instead of having each layer be, be filled, can one, for instance, um, use just an outline so that one could possibly read what's going on on the inside, what's going on, this geometry that's going on in the inside of the column, which now is, is not visible at all. Um, I, I think these are, these are some of the, the questions that, that, that could be interesting for these columns, too. Um, there is, there's two more images here, I think. And, and what, what, what you are seeing a bit of, I think, in this one or in this one, is that, the, in this one, though, 
But in these, is that the columns are designed in such a way that they, they um, when, and when one enters the room, it's, it's actually quite effective. One, one initially thinks one is looking at, first of all, the whole room looks bigger through the mirrors, but initially one thinks there are more columns in the room than there are. There's only four. Um, but it, it looks like 16 because the columns are designed in such a way that they, they are, are different from different, they look different from different perspectives. So they have either only rotational symmetry along one axis or along um, uh, 60 degree ac um, segments and, and so on. Um, what is next? It's, it's, I think, something that I, I, I just hinted at. It's, I, I think if one, one moves forward, one, and one would, well, first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to move towards um, create, creating less of an object and more of a, a inhabitable space uh, at, at whatever size. Um, and, and to bring the, the, the ultimate materiality that one renders these forms in into the design process at, a, at an earlier stage. Now, this can be, this can be very limiting. I'm, I'm well aware of that. Um, and and it's, it's, um, it shouldn't be at the level of generating the geometries, but it needs to definitely be at a level, um, at a level of figuring out the permutations, of figuring out how to combine certain permutations. That one, that one decides um, what, what, what characteristics do these materials have? How, how could one use them besides a, a, a def default layering? And um, with that, I would like to finish and, and open it up to questions. how it actually changes the way we think and, and de develop a process, right? And perhaps that's very clear in your presentation. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on that idea, like, because you didn't touch too much on that name somehow. And on, the, on, change, on the undrawable. Did it change the way you thought of, of, of what you could actually do somehow? Um, I, th I think the, the, the name, to be honest, came afterwards. Um, but but um, this this... Nature, and this is something that I think I, I, I spoke of in, in earlier today with, with Alyssa. I think the, the interesting thing about using, using these processes, about using um, a, a, a computational approach to architecture, is that one is, um, one is, one is not limited, um, or one is less limited. One, one is um, by, by a design package, and that's what I was alluding to earlier with this Excel versus Maya, suddenly things start to look, look a certain way. Um, and one, one can create, create stuff with, um, with a, and, and maybe this is where the undrawable comes in too, with a, a degree of complexity um, that isn't, isn't possible with traditional processes. And complexity not for the sake of complexity, but complexity for, for the sake of being able to, to create something ideally new, something that, 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 that hasn't, been, hasn't been there before. And, and you could now say, why do we need something new? Um, and and my, 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 my best answer would be, I think that, that we as, 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 as people are, 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 or as humans are, are simply curious and, um, and, and, and like, like to try to use what, what, what tools we have, have in, in, in a given time, in a given, in a given space. But um, the, so, so the undrawable, yeah, it, it, it relates on, on the one level to, to the complexity, but it relates also to the boundaries that you have with um, that you may have with traditional CAD packages, or or even with programs such as Grasshopper. Um, I, I think I think if you take an approach such such as this one by by using processing by by generating a, a script, you, you it not only not only um, forces you to, to think very clearly about what you're doing because you have to define very clearly what you're doing, but 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 ultimately, hopefully, at the end, it, it also um, it also provokes a sense of ownership. Um, of the process. So earlier today we spoke about vectors and Rubik and, and you were actually talking about vectors and processing and, and how you can kind of quickly produce transformations and I'm wondering just because I can only imagine what you have to go through 
to assemble one of these cones or, or cut mm -hmm. it. I mean, you were saying many hours and yeah. it's incredibly difficult fabrication process. And, and I'm wondering uh, uh, whether you are thinking a little bit also about it, because the, sp the space of the machine could also be described with a similar mathematics to vectors. Yeah. And whether you could imagine marrying really this kind of space of the constraints as a positive input for the yeah. that you design, because to somehow really, because at the moment it seems like one is almost, almost there is a bit of a forced marriage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the results are beautiful. There, there, there is a forced better, marriage. Uh, but potentially, there could be it's a, a marriage between the two. It's it's an it's a it's a really interesting point. I mean, I was I was speaking I think earlier in, or just a minute ago about about bringing in some of the, simply the material properties, but, but bringing in the properties of the machine is, is um, at least as interesting. Um, and it's, it's something I think that Jose was mentioning earlier in terms of a 3D printer. What if on a 3D printer one wouldn't have to provide it with a, I, I don't know how many of you have used a 3D printer, printer but you usually give it a, a three-dimensional model, an STL model, but why not reprogram it so that you're just telling it where to actually draw Draw what what line to draw, what um, what what space, how to move. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sure one will get very very different results. And the other quick question I have, sorry, I'm taking so much time, but it seems to be that you are in love with symmetry, which obviously then produces certain uh, coherence and very beautiful patterns. But I'm wondering because it, within your process, mm -hmm. it would be very easy to, for instance, when you were describing, you um, uh, mutate one column yeah. with another as a post-processing. Uh, yeah. Did you ever try to engage it to, during the generative process because obviously you can automate the rules or do some other symmetry breaking? Yeah, there, there, there is symmetry. Uh, there's or a is lot. Is there some reason for you no, to love there, symmetry? Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, that, but I think in, in the platonic solid work, there, there's, there's an even, even more of a symmetry. They're, they're symmetrical along basically three axes because the, the input form that is used, the, the, the platonic solids are a cube is symmetrical or a pyramid has some sort of, um, has some sort of symmetry. Um, a, a, a column, if it's not articulated, has some sort of symmetry. Um, one, one could easily break this though. And I think um, in the, the, if one compares the first column prototype towards the ones that are shown in Guangzhou, um, they, the, the Guangzhou ones are, are only have symmetry along one axis as, as opposed to two um, or um, along half an axis if one, one will. And, um, and, and, and to me, I, I, I like them more in a way. They may not, they may not um, have, have the same level of detail, but I think they are, more, they are more interesting as shapes. Do I want to completely let go of the symmetry? I, do, I don't know. I think there is some, there is a point at which just in terms of how people read it, people start to think that there is, an, and, and maybe this is just a question of perception, that there's an arbit a complete arbitrariness to the, the form that is there if, there is, if, there, if they can't recognize a system of order. I think perhaps, perhaps the symmetry helps people recognize that there is some sort of system of order in it. And it, it's, not a, it's not just a, a symmetry of one axis towards another, but it's also motives in the column that repeat throughout the column, which which perhaps hint at, at a system of order behind it. Maybe, maybe that maybe that's the maybe that is the reason that some of these look look symmetrical. Uh, yeah. and if, and if a question about the kind of contradiction inside the work, because when you look to, to the surface, there is an incredible motif which are structural, beautiful structure inside. Beautiful structure. And you choose the, the column, which mm -hmm. is a static element, pipe, the most classical element uh, of architecture, to demonstrate some dynamic. It's dynamic. Could, could we imagine that uh, an auto structuration of the motifs, uh, or uh, a structure which, which could be defined by the motif as an architecture, and leaving completely this world of the pipe? That, on the other side, I like the idea of the column because this reminds me, the, of course, the classical architecture, but mm -hmm. also the the famous competition about uh, the Eraltier de Fribourg, where Adolf Lotz was yes. involved in. The references of Ansolai to the column, and uh, you can play with. That uh, the limit is, uh, uh, can, you, can you organize the reverse? The fact that the motif became structural, could become structural. I think so. I think, I think that would be an, an interesting challenge. 
in in a way the the amount of freedom you you amount of freedom you leave the shape is is something that you can control so so i so very clearly i said whether whether intentionally or or on some level um that that the shape that comes out has to somehow still resemble a column but this 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 input mesh in in this case yeah also a very abstracted column is so general that um that that anything any, anything could happen and and one can use these these attributes of the shapes that come out whether they're topographical or topological to control what happens in the in the later processes so one could one one could imagine a form that that starts to incorporate um topographical topological features not only um how many um weights are how many faces are connected but also where am i located in space is there is there something beneath me something that um would start to approximate a structure i think i think that could be possible it's something that that isn't isn't happening here um but which might be very interesting um i mean it's obvious that the, the work that you're doing has strong analogy visual analogy analogy with the baroque and the rococo and probably this has sort of been made this comparison very often um but i'm i'm interested in 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 the notion of the world of the ornamental that you that you mentioned difference to the decorative mm-hmm. because you know being interested myself in, in the world of ornamentation and, and the value of that right now how much of it is is for you important to remain on the decorative level and how much on the ornamental and i extend the question to the to this step that you made between the computer simulation and the image into the real physicality yeah where i think there are, there are terms that cross my mind once you show the physical work that i found interesting that i didn't think about when you just showed the computational work which was the whimsical the frivolous mm-hmm. the kitsch the grotesque yeah. sort of adjectives that on the computer didn't cross my mind once i saw them physically build the poems i thought interesting it's getting into a sort of different territory and and i just wonder how interested are you in this difference between the decorative and the ornamental or in these adjectives that sort of allude to other conditions that then ultimately start influencing the way that you uh, manipulate in a way these different uh, uh, iterations and interpretations uh, in a way coming back to what you said that at some point you felt quite removed from the process because you were sort of creating the first seeds and then blocking them and freezing them yeah but sort of at some point w- wishing that the computer does everything for you yeah I I just wonder how much you're interested in these aspects and how much they might influence your work in the in the next year. I think well, it's it's interesting that you you mentioned um the the baroque um as as an association because the the associations that people have have written about or told me about are are the, one gets everything from gothic to baroque to of course classical to just reptile to underwater creature to and and and, and so on. um and this 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 goes back to and so i find it very difficult to to actually differentiate i find it very difficult to classify what what i'm seeing and i find it difficult also to differentiate between ornament and decor to differentiate between um between certain styles or prototypes of styles i i ask myself i ask myself quite a bit why 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 stop the process now why do i choose this one and and not an, another one um i i wish i would have a at this point a more um concrete concrete answer to that question um it is i i i'm not i i i struggle with this um but in in terms of comparing this to the to the earlier processes what i what i feel is is nice about this this subdivision or what i find more more interesting about is that um i think one there is there is um they are deterministic they're not predictable but there's no real randomness or only if you permit a bit of ran- randomness so there's an int- really an intentionality to 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 most most of the details to most of the things you see which isn't to say that some <laughs> some things pop up which one didn't anticipate but um but these are these are things that looking back at the parameters can be explained can be manipulated that one can take 
not ownership of, but that one can that one can develop, that one can work with, and this this isn't possible in the earlier forms. So you're saying that the key is in the process or in the form? Can you say it again? You think that the beauty of this, of this uh, is on the form or in the process of the key? Um. I don't know. I don't. I. I. One, once again, it's. It's for me. It's having having programmed it. It's. It's. It's difficult to differentiate to, to tear it apart. Um, I. What. What I find very appealing about the process is, though. Though the process is applied in, in in a variety of ways, it's an incredibly simple process. I mean, it's just a face that gets divided, and the next face gets divided, and gets divided. So I can. I can definitely find a, a beauty, a beauty in that, or an enthusiasm for that. Um, it's, I, or, or just about the fact that there, there's very little there from the beginning, that there's nothing there from the outset. It's not like uh, I, I, idealized shapes which one is rearranging or scaling. It's not uh, Palladianist in that sense. Or, um, so, so that is something I can get excited about. But ultimately, um, I don't know, one, ultimately the forms are, are, are there and, and, and that is, that is what, what is produced. It's, it's few people that look at the, the process. Um, I don't know. I mean, you 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 get the you you get the reptiles, you get the gothic, you get the so in a way they, they they seem to be something that has that has all been there before, or or features that have been there before. I think what is original, or what I would hope would be original, is the the process by which they're generated, um, and and it is, um, and I think this this. The, the output of this process isn't limited to, to what you see here. I think um, it, it can be used to produce other, other typologies, other, other forms, which, um, which, which hopefully wouldn't would be conceivable and which, which hopefully will at some point um, defy, perhaps defy these, these, these easy analogies of this is Baroque, this is Gothic. Yes, please. And uh, you mentioned uh, topology and process in your work. Um, and what I found was uh, like the, the topologies and like the structures of the models are very beautiful. Uh, but once they get to this physical stage, it kind of seems to fall apart in the sense that you know, based on the production method mm -hmm. of everything kind of being digitized and sliced up in layers, I mean, you, you, you tend to lose the lines and like, the surfaces and the curves. So I'm wondering, um, in your process, is there any way of you know merging the uh, the actual fabrication the crossover from digital to analog, um, and perhaps you know seeing if the computer can help you decide how how it's actually produced, and maybe in terms of you know varying you know, planes and stacking these things. Yeah, that that that's exactly that's exactly where where I'm at, I'm at right now, um, in the sense that the the program right now it it um, doesn't present the form as a mesh, but it presents it as as whatever slicing method of slicing, be it at, at, at certain angles or at certain intervals or thicknesses, um, I, I, am, I um, specify, and I can I can use these inputs to, and this is what I was mentioning earlier in terms of taking the material properties into the design process, um, and I can use these to, for instance, create certain lot, certain um, almost like if you're working in a 3D program, like a, a attached to grid kind of. Kind of structure, so I can say, okay, one this intersection has to happen at a certain point or at a multiple of a certain amount of layers, and, and so on. So, so yes, I think that um, that that is something um, that that I'm I'm beginning to use. Um. Thank you. The last question. Mm -hmm. 
you know, think that each each phase of the of the um, you get four out of that and that could be very original or all very different. Yeah. Um, what, what determines the when, when, yeah, just just to, to to bring up the earlier point. Yes, yes, I I, I did say um, I, I I wish they they produced themselves, um, but um, that don't don't take that too seriously. I, I very much like having uh, be, being the one that is that is actually desi de, de, um, not just creating the process, but also designing designing how they look, um, uh, or designing what kind of attributes they have or um, how they, how they manifest itself. When, when do you stop the process? Well, there's two ways to think about stopping the process. There's one is just to stop dividing a certain iteration. And in that sense, they are all, um, all these columns from Guangzhou, and I can go, go back and then you can see it a little bit, are, are um, brought to the same iteration, I think, eight levels of subdivision. But, um, but certain parts of the column are, are frozen earlier, and other parts, are, um, and other parts continue to subdivide. Um, but if you're if you're referring to the fact um, when do you stop producing iterations and when do you when when do you when do you choose one over the the other and say I'm not going to develop this further that well that's that's the big question that that I don't know in terms of when to stop the process that's limited by at a certain point you have um, the, the iteration the subdivision process at a certain point you get to I don't know 32 million facets and then each facet will be smaller than a millimeter and then it doesn't make sense anymore because you're only using one millimeter slices to produce it. Um, and, and you run into memory limitations at yeah, something like 32 million. Um, so, so you're physically limited there, but I, that, that limit is going to change. Um, but you are, um, but it is, and that's, that's what you're seeing here. I'll just play this one last time. So if I wanted to zoom in more, I would have to blend out other parts of it. You're, you're actually reaching the limits of the computer. But how do you, how do you um, say, I'm going to stop developing this prototype and, and say it's a finished column? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the key question. Thank you very much. <laughs>